So what I want you to imagine is this notion of, of creation, uh, Big Bang Theory, whatever your ideology is, um, and this environment that comes into being, um, the universe, the planet. And within that universe and that planet, there are various um, creations that interact, that work together to make this universe functional. So each one contributes to the well, towards the well-being of the other. One feeds off the other in one way or the other. Um, and each one has a central role to play um, that is very integral to, to the functioning and to the well-being of this, this universe, this, um, this environment that we create. Um, it's, it's a circle of life. Everything is connected, nothing is disconnected. Um, and it's a circle in, on many different levels in the sense that, you know, there's, there's this link between different species um, and, and the different species are important to each other, but also, there's also this generational circle, you know, the perpetuity of life. Um, you, um, animals give birth to animals, human species give birth to human species, and so life continues in, in that sense. And within that circle of life, you've got various um, plants and various animals that play a, a role a role within 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 the biosphere. So, for an instance, if you think about the cultive the the natural organic rooibos, which is a carbon fixing plant that grows up the west coast uh, of the Western Cape, um, it's it's very very critical um, in that environment because it's it's um, sorry I called it a carbon fixing, but it's actually a nitrogen fixing. Um, plant. It's very critical to that environment because all of the other animals and, 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 and all the other plants are very, very dependent on this ability to add nutrients to the soil and to the earth, and then they all thrive within that environment. And so what's happened in the last uh, couple of hundred years is that as we've realized the, the benefits of rooibos to humans, um, we have sort of engineered the plant and then come with a scientifically produced rooibos version, um, which is not the organic version. And so we've got these cultivated ones where farmers have come in and cleared the old organic rooibos because it doesn't grow quickly enough and doesn't make good financial sense. And so therefore they want something that kind of thrives quicker and has a quicker turnaround and is good for mass production and to, to sell and to make profits. And so, the, the problems, the problem with that uh, new version of the plant is that it is not nitrogen fixing. And so therefore other plants around it do not thrive. Um, the biodiversity is cleared from the area and it becomes monoculture. And so the, 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 the service, the role and the function that it performs within that environment is completely lost. Um, think of the sun, which exists outside of this um, circle of life, um, but is very integral to the circle of life, uh, provides energy, energy that's converted into so many different uses. We are not capable of manufacturing energy, so we're very dependent on the sun's energy, the photosynthesis process that takes place within the plants, plants that are consumed by animals. And those of us that do still eat meat, uh, we consume the animals and that's, that is converted to our, uh, for, for calorific, calorific uh, purposes within our bodies. And then we use that to be able to function, to work, to move, to, to play and to have our being. Um, and the same thing when we consume plants, we, we convert that energy and it becomes, you know, uh, very, very useful for our purposes. I think of moss, if you guys can picture the moss that grows on a rock, the fact that moss grows on a rock tells you that it is not, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, very vital part of, of the ecosystem. Um, it isn't dependent on soil to get its nutrients. Uh, it has other ways of, of, of finding, um, uh, you know, ways of, of, of uh, absorbing uh, nutrients, but it's very, very critical as a carbon sequester, um, you know, plays a very big role when it comes to the, the whole photosynthesis pr uh, pr process, uh, cleaning water systems, cleaning um, air purification systems. So everything within this space performs the function 
plays a role. It's very integral, very important to the function um, of, 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 of each other. And we cannot do it without the other. Whether it's it's um, you know water systems, uh, whether it's the ants, we had that session uh, where we spoke about the bees and the fact that um, a, a large number of the bee population has been wiped out, and it's very critical to food production. And so, when we think of the system, we we need to understand that the system is very functional, and in an ideal state, it is good. Um, yes, there are rogue uh, elements of system and I can think of one very big one um, that kind of dominates and takes this central role within the system but that aside when when you really process what the system is set out to do and what it does it's a very functional system and it has functioned in in this manner for millions and millions and millions of years and it has had its own uh, ability to regulate as various um, uh, natural disasters and earthquakes and that sort of thing have come up, it's, it's, it's found ways to regulate and to, you know, to keep itself kind of within a, a, a functional uh, parameter um, and, and rejuvenate and, you know, re resuscitate its, its, its functions. Now, within that system, you have another system, uh, which we shall call the social system. And social system is also part of this um, ecosystem. So, you know, it, it performs a role, it's, it's got a functional role that's important. Um, and in an ideal state, it is also good. Now, the problem comes when that social, and, and within that social system, uh, when we zoom in and start to think about how that system functions, uh, the, the human social systems, um, you know, we, 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 we can appreciate that there are other functions that are you know, that are part of the social system, you know, uh, things like um, education, um, interaction, relations, um, you know, cultural systems that are very, very integral to our survival. So we come up with, with novel ways um, to be able to survive in this, in, in this space that, that we occupy. Um, communications, um, systems of social organization, capital growth and development, not all growth, uh, not all development has been negative um, and has been bad. If you think of, you know, uh, systems like hospital systems that are very, very important for the well-being uh, of people, some of the things that we have developed have actually played a very central role to improving the life expectancy of humans improving the well-being of, of, of people, um, um, you know, making sure that people have better foods, you know, available, are able to store food for, for consumption for longer periods of time. So not everything that is, is related to growth and related to capital and related to development has necessarily been bad and evil. Um, it's been a part of this system, this ecosystem, and, and it's, it's contributed to the good. Some of it's even contributed to the good of other um, species within the system. If you think of um, the advances that we've been able to make when it comes to um, uh, veterinary services, um, and also, you know, the storage of seeds and plants to ensure that we, we maintain some, some form of, you know, um, uh, for a lack of a better word, some sort of seed sovereignty um, within the different different systems that we, we occupy. So when we start to think about growth and development, like I said, you know, it has not all been bad. Some of the advancements that we've made have been very, very positive and have been very, very good. Um, and, you know, have been the result of imaginaries that have gone beyond themselves and found uh, ways in which we could ameliorate um, these resources that we have available to us and have been able to use those resources for good. Um, the ability to harness energy, if you think way back before the agrarian era, uh, Paleolithic Lithic times when, um, when humans were hunter-gatherers, they, 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 
they didn't have the ability to harness energy and to convert that energy for other uses that could be used for, for, for growth and for development and for coming up with systems that are beneficial to society. So they were largely just dependent on animals and dependent on, on um, vegetation. But with time, that has improved. We've found ways to be able to uh, convert energy systems and to be able to use them for other forms of, of, of growth. So we've been able to improve food security. And if you think about um, population, the world population prior to the industrial, uh, industrial revolution, um, I think we kind of bobbed up and down around the few hundred millions right up until the, the first industrial revolution. And then if you look at round about uh, the turn of the century, the last century, uh, 1900s, world population stood at about 2 billion. At about um, 19, in the 1950s, that population grew to about 2.5 billion. And this was testament to what uh, we were capable of and what we were able to do as humans and how we were able to improve um, our social systems, how we're able to improve life, how we're able to improve health, how we're able to improve food productivity and food security. Now, it's taken from around about the 1950s to, to the current time for the world population to blow up from about 2.5 billion to we're sitting at around about 7 billion now. So in 70 years, world population has trebled it has grown so phenomenally um, compared to what it used to be uh, pre, pre the, the Industrial Revolution. And what can we attribute this to? We can only attribute it to the ability of people to imagine and to come up with innovation, to come up with systems, to come up with ways, to come up with, um, you know, um, hospitals, to come up with plastic um, to improve human well-being. If you think of a hospital, half the things that are in a hospital are made of plastic, um, from syringes um, to UV to the, you know, the cables that, that run um, 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 the intravenous drips from, from, you know, from, the, from the packets that they, they contain it in, in, into your body. And this has been very, very important in that it has improved our health and it has improved our well-being. Now, where it starts to go pear-shaped when we zoom in on this narrative around growth and development is when certain um, ways of thinking around the, the things we create take over. For instance, greed. When we suddenly begin to rationalize the need to grow personal wealth or to grow profitability and to consume a lot more than what we need to create a need that doesn't exist in order in order to drive sales so that i can grow personal wealth or i can grow the wealth of my investors um, and give them better returns on the investment and as as this has happened we began to see growing inequalities. Um, the richer start to become richer, the poorer remain poor, and the gap between uh, those, you know, those two different social classes ever so widening. When you think about what's happened in the last uh, couple of years with, with COVID and how the richest have even, you know, grown their riches beyond, in spite of having given away as much as they can, um, they continue to grow wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. And as this development machine continues to consume and to grow and to, um, you know, to find ways to, to, to you know, to, to feed the hunger that um, our social systems have, we also start to see the spewing of carbon emissions. Um, in the 1950s, uh, it, it was worked out that we were consuming roughly about 10 billion tons uh, of material and resources from the earth, extracted biomass and, and, um, and agricultural. Today, we are consuming about 70 billion tons. In 70 years, we have multiplied that consumption rate, that meta metabolism rate by seven times. And 
in that process, we have denuded 50% of our forests. Um, um, we've had the conversation about the bees. Um, we've lost a lot of the biodiversity that, ex that exists as we've built cities, as we've cleared uh, forests and, and replaced them with plantations because we need the wood to, to, you know, for, for our coffee tables and for our beds and our furniture and that sort of thing. And so as we've cleared, we are losing that which is the essence of the good because we are making bad decisions that are driven by, by profits that, are driv that, that drive consumption, that create a need. How many of us here have a two-year policy on cell phones? We will not keep a cell phone longer than two years because, simply because my new contract is, is due in two years. And so once it gets there, we get rid of our old phone and then we go in and, and buy a new phone. Well, guess what? If all of us are doing that, we are driving a demand for these new cell phones. And as we drive the demand for the cell phones, there's a bigger demand for the cobalt that needs to be mined in Zambia, that needs to be mined in the Congo, in order to make the cell phones that we, we are consuming at such a rapid, rapid pace. Very few of us are asking questions around what does the person who mines that cobalt in the Congo earn? And I want to encourage some of you to actually research this. Research cobalt in the Congo and the miners of the Congo. Look for YouTube, YouTube videos. You are going to be surprised by what um, these miners have to endure in order for Silicon Valley to get the cobalt that it needs to manufacture the phone that you consume and you turn over so often. Because their lives are really... Um, negatively affected. A lot of them actually live in debt because they have to take out debt in order to be able to go down the mines and work the mines for a period of time before they bring out any 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 uh, amounts of cobalt. Um, and then before they can actually enjoy the fruits of their labor, they first have to pay back that debt at exorbitant amounts of, of interest. And this is all driven by demand. It's driven by, by um, this capitalistic um, you know, unkind consumer, um, unkind product, production uh, system um, that continues to want to drive profit uh, by driving consumption. And sometimes the excuses that are given uh, for this sort of behavior are that capital, capital, without capitalism, we're not going to be able to do away with, with poverty. Now, I don't really want to argue that point. What I want to argue is why in 270 years are we still seeing this widening gap and the poor getting poorer and the rich getting richer if capitalism is meant to, to, to really drive that, uh, to drive poverty away. Um, waste is growing and we don't know what to do with a lot of our waste. Um, in South Africa, I think the statistic is we actually wastes around about 33% of the food that we produce. And yet we have so many hungry people that go without a meal. How many of us are tossing materials that we are, we are not able to utilize to their fullest potential without thinking about who else could benefit from this, whether it's food or uh, a product or whatever it is. How many of us are not rethinking what we should be doing with our waste in ways that is less detrimental to the environment, but also socially um, socially beneficial for those who, who do not have um, that, that, that struggle that's, 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 that needs uh, more in order for their lives to improve. Um, we spoke about airplanes in the last session and, and how we need to rethink um, you know, what, what our patterns and our behavior. And this is not to say you can't never ever fly, but it's to say we need to stop and have that process and think, how could I do this differently? And how could I do this better? Should I be flying for this particular instance? Could I maybe do it in a different way? Can we carpool and drive to Cape Town or whatever the case may be? Can we catch the train? You know, however that process needs to be imagined, we need to be having that process and not blindly jumping onto an airplane and taking off plastics. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard that, according to, to science, to the scientists, they're saying 
every single water body currently on earth now contains um, microplastics. Now, to me, that's very shocking. Um, it's very shocking because plastics have, have not been around for a very, very long time. They've been around for less than 200 years, if, depending on where you place, um, you place plastics as having first been introduced. If you, if you place them kind of the 18, early 1830s, or if you place them around about 19, 1907, which is when the first synthetic plastics were, were produced, the 1830s, they, they produced the, the styrofoam uh, versions. Now, if you think of the short space of time that we've had plastic, and the fact that these plastics have broken down into microplastics, they enter our waterways, we consume them in the water that we drink, they are consumed by the fish um, that, that lives, that lives in, in, in these water bodies, and we have no clue what these are doing to the fish. Are they carcinogenic? Um, are we consuming um, food that's carcinogenic? Are we, um, are we endangering lives that are solely dependent on the consumption of fish? Uh, by these mi microplastics and some of these communities hardly hardly ever consume or use plastics and yet the water bodies that they have to to um, pull water from are now contaminated with water pl with plastic and there isn't enough research for us to actually know what this plastic is doing to the fish there isn't enough research to know what it's doing to us who are consuming the fish that consumes the plastic so how should we be thinking around the bad that is plastic, um, and and how can we change that that whole system? Um, oil is another big thing, and I'm sure a lot of you are looking at oil prices and seeing what you're having to pay um, at at the petrol pump now for oil. But the one of the biggest culprits when it comes to uh, environmental degradation and when it comes to um, the climate crisis is actually the emissions of greenhouse gases um, as a result of energy, the production of energy uh, from, from things like oil. And so how are we supporting this, um, this ex ex you know, the, 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 the continued use of this extractive? And what could we be doing differently so that we are not contributing to, this, to, to, to the problem, but we're finding ways around the solution? So when we talk about the bad around, and this is about the, the decisions and the outcomes of, um, you know, of some of these decisions that we make, one of the outflows of that is the ugly. And then the ugly really starts to zoom in on what happens when we are consuming so much oil and so much, um, and burning so much uh, materials in our environment. It's you now have this um, higher rise of carbon carbon emissions amongst other greenhouse gases. Um, you're looking at the, you know, the, the climatic disruption is happening even faster. And if you remember at the beginning of my talk, I spoke about how the earth is able to, was able to regulate in the past whenever there was some sort of disaster that took place. Well, what's happening now is that we don't give the earth enough room to breathe and to recover. And so this is why this is now the ecological and, and um, climatic disaster that we're sitting with. It's the earth is not able to regulate a lot of what we are releasing into the atmosphere quickly enough, simply because we are releasing so much of it and consuming so much material unnecessarily it's, it's not able to, you know, to filter out and to, to get itself to a, to a point of equilibrium. And so we're reaching tipping points um, that, that have got a very, very negative uh, effect on, 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 our, on our environment. Um, the, 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 the scientists say roughly about 40% um, of ice-free land is already in use. So we are, we are colonizing a whole lot of land and we're turning it into use and often it's monoculture. We're clearing land for, for food, we're clearing land for, for pl tree, uh, tree plantations that are not part of the ecosystems. We're, we're clearing land for, for animals, uh, we're clearing land for human, um, you know, human dwelling and, and populations and cities. And the earth is 
groaning beyond its cap capability, its capacity. Um, roughly, they estimate about 23,000 flora and fauna to date has, has now gone ex extinct as a result of man-made um, decisions and um, you know the impact of human activity within the environment. And, and, and a word you'll start to hear quite a lot of is a word um, called the Anthropocene. Anthropo meaning people, Anthropocene, um, the impacts of people on the planet. Um, we are now living in an era where people are making the greatest um, impact on the environment, way more than what the the uh, the meteorites and the volcanoes and the tsunamis of past have ever done because then the environment could recover right now our environment is incapable of recovering because we continue to just pile on the um the almost the onslaught uh, with within within the, the 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 environment and so as a result um, we continue to see things like social stratification that happens. Um, a lot of this was touched on in the movie where, you know, we're seeing others, we're creating classes, and, and these classes are based either based on, on race or they based on the economic standing within society. Um, more and more exploitation for the capital system to thrive the way that it, it thrives today. It is actually dependent on profitability. And in order to be profitable, you need to be able to negotiate down what you pay in wages. You need to be able to, um, to rationalize your, your rate of, of extraction. Uh, you need to be able to, to, to give a justification for why you need to make the profits that you need to be able to make. And, and this, you know, the growth in materialism uh, we spoke about cell phones, um, you know, the, the desire for materials that we often don't utilize to the maximum. Sometimes we actually don't even need some of those materials. Somebody spoke about clothes that are only worn twice, uh, sold at, at a premium. And these things happen. I, I have heard of people who have such wardrobes where clothes are never worn. Uh, clothes sit in the wardrobe and it gets worn once and that's it. And then they, they, they get rid of it. So this material materialistic, this ravenous hunger for um, unnecessary consumption of materials, this metabolic flow of, um, of, of material that we extract from the earth, that we grow uh, in order to satisfy a certain hunger driven by, by, by uh, corporates and by, by, uh, by financial economic um, motives. Um, and then the growth of inequality um, and, and how we treat people, the injustices that arise as, as, as a result of not being um, within the same class as we are. And so the ugly, um, and so the ugly begins to take on the shape of, um, you know, hotter days, inclement weather. We spoke about inclement weather, deforestation, the loss of biodiversity diversity, species loss. And if you remember that whole interconnectivity conversation that I, I, I kicked off with and I said, everything is very vital to everything. Everything is important. Everything serves a purpose. Everything is in its place. Well, once we start to lose biodiversity, it starts to fall apart. And when it starts to fall apart, it becomes an environmental um, catastrophe. And environmental catastrophe has led to this climatic uh, problems that we sit with because we are not able to um, reduce the amount of carbon that we are spewing into the environment. Why? Because we're cutting down the trees that act as carbon sequesters. Um, and, and so a lot of the sequestration is forced on the ocean, which then leads to ocean acidification, where it should really have been balanced between other elements within the environment. And so it then leads to, to climate change. And this is all as a result of that one word, the Anthropocene, the impact of humans on, on the environment. And this is where the, the ugly sits. And unfortunately, we can't run away from the ugly because it affects us. It affects us in the global South, even more, um, more so, regardless of the fact that we are not consuming necessarily at the same levels that the West is, but 
we sit with ambitions to actually get there. We sit with ambitions to grow our economies to, to what the West is. Um, and if you think about it, if Africa had developed at the speed and the scale that the global um, North has, perhaps this, the, the Earth's plug or the Earth's fuse would have been blown a long time ago. If you think about it, Africa's retarded uh, growth and retarded um, uh, 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 you know, reaching out towards uh, the, these um, kind of very ameliorated societies might actually have been the Earth's saving grace. And so it becomes a very difficult conversation to have because now it feels like Africa is being told that you need to save the Earth. And I heard this coming through more and more and more in our last conversation. And we're being told to chill out when it comes to growth um, and development while the, the, the rest of the world has gone, on and gone out and, 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 and gone on itself. And yet, at the same time, there is some logic to some of that in the sense that if we don't, the very things that we are wanting to um, aspire to or we are aspiring to are the very things that could actually stop us in our tracks and we don't actually get to fully realize the things that we're saying we want to, to achieve and to attain. So how can we begin to reimagine growth in ways that allow us to feed our people, to attain a level of well-being, to attain good health, uh, just as the, world, the, the, the global north has, without actually destroying the planet in the process. So I want you to look at this. Um, so it kind of gives you a picture of what has happened on, on planet Earth since the 1950s. So around about 1949, World War II came to an end. And when World War II came to an end, the, a lot of the countries that had been involved in World War II or affected by World War II actually um, went on, 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 on a, a, a growth and development trajectory of rebuilding their countries. And round about the 1950s, you'll see that, which uh, we refer to as the hockey stick curve, there was a sudden spike. So if you look at the, the squares or the, the rectangles on the left in, in red and orange, um, those are social systems um, that suddenly spiked uh, the world population group. If you remember I spoke about it being 2.5 around about the 1950s and then suddenly now we're sitting with about seven, eight uh, billion people. Uh, urban population also grew. So there was a, a, a load of urbanization that took place around about the same time. And then large dams, the construction of large dams. And these dams, what was really scary about this is that they were not actually being constructed for water or, or to, to ensure water, water security. They were actually being constructed for energy. This was hydro, uh, big hydro bills, the Kariba and, and, and all these other dams that you can think of uh, in order to feed the hunger for, for energy. Um, the growth in transportation, telecommunication, uh, international tourism, people flying all over the world uh, and, and sudden um, spurts of, of, uh, of airlines going all over the, the place, paper production, fertilizer consumption. This is a big one. It's a major one because now we're trying to, to solve the problem of uh, the lack of biodiversity and plants that actually bring nutrients into the environment. So we come up with, with fertilizers and that has had its own ripple effect. Um, the, uh, what they refer to the, the, as the eutrophication of our water bodies. So when, when we plant and we use fertilizers, the ground doesn't actually utilize all the fertilizer that we put into the, in, in, into the soil. And so as it rains, there's a lot of runoff of fertilizer, which ends up in our water bodies. And that fertilizer then leads to what we call uh, water eutrophication. The fish starts to consume these fertilizers. And once again, we have no idea what the impact of that scenario is. And then we consume the fish. So the, the use of fertilizers in itself 
um, has produced greater yields of food, but it has had unintended consequences that we are still trying to figure out what do they exactly mean for us and how do they shift uh, our world as, as we know it. And, so, and some of them we, we know and we understand um, to be some of the, you know, the effects that they have on, on, on our children, effects around um, things such as, um, you know, hay fever, um, things such as allergies, et cetera, et cetera. And we're still learning what are all the impacts that this has had on, 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 our, on our systems. Now, if you look on the right-hand side, you'll see the, the kind of green type squares. Now, the top left one there is carbon dioxide. So simultaneously, sudden spike in the carbon concentration in the atmosphere. Um, Currently, we sit with around about 312 ppm parts per million of carbon concentration within the atmosphere. Now, the boundary by which is an acceptable amount, um, it should be 350 ppm. We're sitting at about 412, and every year it goes up by about 2 ppm. And prior to the Industrial Revolution, it sat at about 200 and I think 250, 270 ppm around about there. So suddenly there's this um, sudden uptick in, in, in carbon dioxide and other um, uh, uh, greenhouse gases within, within the environment, such as methane, uh, nitrous oxide. And then one that I think we mentioned in the movie is this one here, uh, sort of the second row, uh, the third one in the second row, uh, ocean acidification. You see how that one is suddenly spiked up. Uh, coastal nitrogen uh, from, from the fertilizers that we were talking about. Um, and then marine fish capture, uh, that's also suddenly spiked up the amount of consumption of marine fish. And then the bottom left one, tropical forest loss. So the point I'm trying to make here is if you look at what's happening socially on the left-hand side, and if you look at what's happening um, within the environment and the systems that we're dependent on, there is a correlation to the decisions and to the impact of human activity on, on the environment. And this is what's leading to the problems that we are seeing today. And, and, and often, it's ignored. People don't want to, um, to come to terms with this reality. Um, there are dissident scientists who will dispute a lot of this, but I don't think it's a coincidence that after 1950s, around right about the time that the Second World War ended, that you see a sudden growth spurt like that. And this is attributed to the sudden demand for all kinds of things, electronics, toasters, um, uh, personal vehicles, um, you name it, suddenly there was a demand for a lot of that and it was all um, predicated on the availability of cheap oil and energy which was needed and used for the, for the, for, for the production of, of these materials. So what has that done? Uh, if you look at the left um, is what we call the planetary boundaries. So the planetary boundaries basically are the safe operating um, levels or the planet or uh, uh, if you want to call it boundary of the earth, meaning that if we surpass those boundaries, then we start to flow into very dangerous territory. So in other words, we have a ceiling when it comes to carbon emissions, and I, I mentioned it in the last slide, 350 ppm. When we transgress that ceiling, uh, we are currently sitting at about 420 plus ppm. When we transgress that ceiling, then the, the planet is no longer able to regulate itself because there is way too much happening too quickly for it to be able to contain um, the, the, the amount of material that we're releasing into the, into the atmosphere. And so then there is pushback. There is environmental degradation, there's a climatic response to what we're doing within the environment. Uh, chemical pollution, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, loading, um, that's a, a, as a result of you know, fertilizers and the amount of material that we are, we are harvesting from, from the environment. So if you, if you see the three, the, the four yellow blocks, those four yellow blocks, 
those currently are indicating the four different um, elements where we have actually pushed the boundary be beyond its limits. So the one that you'll see is biodiversity loss, land conversion, we've converted way more land than what we need to be doing. And then of course the, the, the climate change. Um, and then if you look at the nitrogen and, and phosphorus loading. Um, and then if you look at, I think for two of those, the um, probably the, the chemical pollution and the air pollution, those are growing very quickly uh, at a rate that we actually cannot begin to contain. It's just a matter of time before we, we, we start to transgress, transgress those. What gives me a little bit of hope when it comes to um, environmental crisis or environmental issues, if you remember a few years ago, we had problems around the ozone layer depletion. And we were able to organize as society and we were able to cut down CFCs and we were able to reduce ozone layer depletion to the point where they were saying that the ozone, uh, the, 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 the hole that was in the ozone layer was now slowly starting to close up, which tells me that we actually are very capable of changing the way we behave uh, and imagining things differently and actually doing what's very beneficial for the environment and beneficial for our societies and beneficial for the other species that we share these spaces. Very unfair that these species are subjected to um, the degradation and the level of destruction uh, based on human greed and human wants when they themselves are not making, making those decisions. So something that has come up um, is uh, as, as a result of wanting to kind of understand what should we be doing as humans to alleviate this problem that we're creating around the environment is what has been referred to as the um, uh, donut economics. I can't remember the lady who, who came up with the, with the concept of donut economics. So if you look at uh, on the right hand side, there is uh, the, the, the inner circle uh, that says what economy, then there's a circle around that that says social foundation. And her, her name is uh, Kate, Kate Raworth. Thanks, Jackie. So social foundation, and that social foundation kind of creates the, um, the minimum basic um, amount of social welfare that we need to be catering to in order for us to be saying that we are living in a more or less sustainable society. And then there's an inner circle, the safe and just space for humanity. And that safe and just space for humanity is the space that we are able to operate in. So if we were able to contain our carbon emissions um, and contain all of these other issues that are kind of blowing out of proportion within that space, then we are operating within a, a safe space. And what that means is that the earth is then able to replenish, it's able to regenerate, and it's able to function as it has done for millennia before. It's not been overwhelmed by what we are putting out into, into the environment. And then if you look at the next um, circle, it's the ecological ceiling. And that's what plain and simple it is. It is a ceiling. We cannot traverse that circle because once we consume beyond that, then we start falling into dangerous territory. So the, the donut economics kind of sits squarely in there, giving us an indication of what we should be thinking about and what we should be doing and how we should be responding to the decisions, the good, the bad, uh, and the ugly that we are making in order to kind of work our way towards some sort of sustainable development until we reach a point of sustainability. The next slide is kind of one of my, uh, my favorite slides. I, I tend to not want to say too much on the slide. Uh, I'm putting it here and I'm gonna give you um, about 30 seconds to kind of um, process what you're seeing on the screen. And then I'd love to hear what some of your, 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 your thoughts are around that slide. Uh, and also feel free to then um, to comment around some of the issues that have come up in this kind of very, very big picture. I know I've gone a little bit crazy overboard, um, but I will 
yeah, give you a chance to, to be able to address and to speak a little bit about that.